let us move forward. Another way of defining brand identity is, uh, is from the perspective of marketing. Now, till now we were seeing uh, how the definition of brand identity from organizations perspective or firms perspective and in the second case we have seen brand identity from the perspective of a designer. Now, we are going to see in this slide onwards, we are going to see how a marketer defines brand identity. And if you see, look at this slide, you will see that at the top it is written Capferrer's brand identity prism. Now, who is Capferrer? You, I have uh, discussed in one of the classes, Capferrer's full name is Jean Noel Capferrer. He is a professor of marketing at HEC Business School in France. He is a person who created this brand identity prism, which we would discuss now. Uh, the other picture that you see in the slide is a six sided hexagon. This hexagon is what Capferrer called as brand identity prism. It has six sides and he gave name to all the six sides. Let us look at them. Now, all the six sides have six names, but there are also four more parts. At the top you see that it is written picture of sender and at the bottom you see picture of the recipient. Now, who is the sender? Sender is the firm, it is the organization it is the brand manager. So, it is the brand manager, it is the organization which is creating a picture of the brand, of the, of the brand identity of the brand and it is sending that picture towards the consumer. So, it is the sender. So, at on one side of the prism, you have the picture of sender. On the other side of the prism, what you have is the picture of a recipient. Who is the recipient? recipient is the consumer. So, picture of the sender is identity and picture of the recipient is brand image. This is something that you can keep in mind when you try to understand what is brand identity prism. Uh, on the horizontal side you see on the left hand side you have externalization and on the right hand side you have internalization. Now, what do they mean? Uh, here also again it is something similar. Internalization means factors that are internal to an organization. So, inside the organization the processes that you would employ to ensure that brand promise that you make is actually delivered. So, brand uh, the interni internalization part of brand identity prism are the factors related to uh, organization, people, organizations, managerial capability, funding and uh, top management, how, uh, what is the vision they have for the brand and for the organization and so on and so forth. So, these are the things come under internalization. Whereas, on the other side, what you have is externalization. What is this externalization? This is again how brands are perceived by consumers, how it appears in the marketplace. So, that is externalization. Now, you let us come to the six sides of the prism. At the top you see that the internal side it is personality and the external side it is physique. Now, external is that which is appears to the customer. You may recollect that in brand iceberg, there was some, some part of the iceberg that was above the water and some part which was below the water. So, this physique is nothing but that which is above the water, that which is seen easily, that which is seen without much effort. So, the moment you think of a brand, what you will, the picture that will emerge in your mind is, is the physique of that brand. But that physique is not enough, it is not complete, this is only the appearance. 
the reality actually lies beneath the water beneath the surface and that what lies beneath the surface is the personality of the brand. So, you can see that brand personality and brand identity are related in a way that brand personality is a part of brand identity. Brand personality is a small part of a larger concept called brand identity. So, in brand identity prism physique uh, a physique draws upon personality and shows only a part of itself. So, that is physique and personality. Second is relationship and culture. Now, relationship and culture means what? Relationship is when say a brand extends its hand to the consumer and it enters into a relationship with the consumer. So, what is the nature of the relationship that a brand enjoys with the consumer is what uh, Cap Ferrer is talking about. So, for example, Lux the relationship that it has with the consumer is that of a fan and a celebrity. So, the, the customer is a fan and Lux is a celebrity. So, that is the relationship that Lux promises to the consumer. Similarly, if you say another brand called Life Boy, Life Boy enjoys another kind of relationship with its customer. Life Boy promises that if you use me, you will be hygienic, you will be clean and you will not attract diseases. So, that kind of relationship the brand Life Boy enjoys with the customer. So, what is the correspondence between relationship and culture? The brand culture of Lux or brand culture of Life Boy will ensure that a certain kind of relationship is formed between the brand and the customer. So, the kind of culture that exists within a brand, uh, that culture determines what kind of relationship the brand will have with its consumer. And finally, we have self image and reflection. It is again something like uh, brand identity and brand image. So, self image means the person who is consuming a certain brand. So, for example, I ride Jeep car or Jeep SUV. So, what is the self image that I have about myself riding a Jeep SUV? So, perhaps I am a person who values power, who values uh, comfort, who values that uh, because Jeep is a slightly high car, it is higher than other sedans. So, anybody who likes SUV probably wants to live a high life. So, that is the kind of self image uh, perhaps I have if I when I am and if I am driving a Jeep SUV. So, this is my self image and when people in the marketplace look at me driving a Jeep SUV, what kind of image they form about me and that is called reflection. So, self image is within me, reflection is in the marketplace. Uh, so, now let us look at this complete picture of uh, brand identity prism. You can see that it can be divided into uh, four parts. One part is picture of sender and picture of recipient. On the other side, we have internalization and we have externalization. On the right hand side, which is the internalization, you remember we were talking of duality, duality of marketplace versus that which exists in our mind. So, that is the duality you can see here also. Internalization is that which is happening inside our mind and externalization is that which is happening in the marketplace. So, that duality can be seen everywhere, that duality can also be seen in this concept of brand identity prism. Now, let us construct one or two uh, examples of this brand identity prism. I will first attempt something that you are familiar with and that is brand Airtel. If you remember in the last class, we uh, developed the brand personality of Airtel. What we also developed 
was brand iceberg of Airtel. Now, let us look at the six facets of brand prism in the context of Airtel. Now, physic and personality correspondence that we have spoken about. So, what we think of uh, Airtel, uh, what we think of first when we think of Airtel is the physic and the physic if you remember from the last class is we immediately think of color red, we also think of mobile phone all right because it is in the telecom industry. But in the in inner side or internal part of Airtel brand is its personality which is fast, which is, which is street smart, which is also opportunist. Opportunist may have slightly negative tone, but it also means that when uh, opportunities come your way, you leverage it, you work upon it so that you grow. And here perhaps I would like to tell you a story which was also recounted to us by Mr. Sunil Mittal uh, who is the owner of Airtel. So, he says that uh, when for the first time the bidding for telecom circles was happening for India, he was participating and it was actually happening in London. And uh, he remembers that uh, he was waiting uh, for the lift to come, so that he will get into the lift and go to the sixth or seventh floor in London in some building where the bidding process will take place. Now, while he was uh, waiting for the lift, he was joined by another person who was perhaps from Tata group and both of them were traveling in the lift to the same floor where the bidding was supposed to take place. Now, in the lift because both were known to each other and they were going for the same purpose, Mr. Sunil Mittal asked him that where are your background papers, the papers where you have done the calculation on the basis of which you have arrived at the bidding amount. So, that person showed him his briefcase that he was carrying and he said that all my papers are inside this briefcase. Mr. Sunil Mittal says that that is the moment I realize that I have won this bid because he said that my background papers were actually one full truck. So, you can imagine the kind of hard work that he did and he made his team to do before he actually came for the bidding process. So, you may call it how we may call it how when an opportunity presents itself, how we work towards it to realize that opportunity. So, that is why uh, Airtel has become what it has become today. Uh, relationship that Airtel enjoys with its customer, we can say that uh, it is an upstart relationship and it is the relationship of an achiever. So, those who are uh, consumers of Airtel, they think of themselves as achievers, they also think of themselves as people with new money, new ambition, people who have that a desire to do well in this life. So, that is the kind of relationship Airtel enjoys with its customers and this relationship is facilitated by the organizational culture which is of materialism and utilitarianism. Here also I will tell you one story. In the in one of the annual general meetings of, uh, of uh, Airtel, all of us and it was perhaps in 2002, uh, which was still early days for Airtel. I remember the president of the mobile business, he said that in the last annual general meeting, uh, the employees came and we barely had 20 or 30 cars. And in this meeting, where we have again large number of employees attending the meeting, we have more than 400 or 500 people coming in their respective cars. So, what he said is that in a matter of one year, we have managed to create so much wealth for our employees. So, you can see the culture in the organization is of materialism and utilitarianism. So, because of that, the kind of relationship that the brand has with its customer gets determined. Similarly, uh, the last point reflection is arrived or 
new kid on the block. Now, we may not consider Airtel as a new kid on the block because we have Jio which is the new kid on the block and that has kind of redefined telecom space. But at one point of time, Airtel was a new kid in the block and if you look at the larger picture of Airtel versus Reliance, it, Airtel will still be a new kid in the block because Reliance is a much older organization and it is also primarily into manufacturing especially oil refinery. So, uh, Reliance still is considered to be an older organization and Airtel a new organization. So, in that sense Airtel is still a new kid on the block. So, therefore, the reflection that uh, people will have of uh, consumers using Airtel brand they will think that these are the people who think that they have arrived in life and they are the people who are something like new kid on the block. Similarly, if you look at the self image which is the internal part of it, people think that they are confident and they are ready to take on the world. So, this is how a uh, brand prism of Airtel brand can be constructed and uh, I hope you have understood uh, uh, how this brand prism operates with the help of this example. I will do one more example, so that because Airtel is something that we have been talking about. Let us look at another brand about which we have not really spoken about and that is a brand called Lacoste. Now, many of you would be familiar with this brand. This is a t-shirt brand and it is a rather expensive brand. Uh, perhaps the image that would come to your mind when you think of Lacoste is people wearing these t-shirts and playing golf. You may also recollect that when you walk into the stores of Lacoste, you will see t-shirts of different shades of color arranged side by side. So, can, so that you can easily see the difference between colors. The colors are very vibrant, they are very stable and they are of very high quality. So, let us look at the, the six sides of the brand prism when it comes to Lacoste brand. So, personality, physique, correspondence, the moment you think of Lacoste, what you see, what is visible to your eyes is one of course, it is a quality t-shirt, then it has some kind of connection with tennis. So, you will see that many uh, sports uh, personalities, when they play uh, their game, they wear Lacoste t-shirt. So, you may have seen the logo of Lacoste on their t-shirts. You may also see uh, golfers wearing Lacoste t-shirt. So, category wise Lacoste is something like a sports wear, close to sports wear. Another image that is very common when you think of Lacoste is that of a crocodile. It of course, is a part of the logo, but moment you think of Lacoste, you also think of crocodile. But this is the physique, this is the appearance, but what really is happening inside, happen, what is happening inside is something that is discrete. So, you will see that in the t-shirt these, these ideas whether it is crocodile or the word Lacoste, they are not very loud, they are in a very small space and it is not announcing loudly that I am Lacoste, I am Lacoste. So, Lacoste is a discrete brand slowly it will subtly hint that I am Lacoste, it will not really loudly proclaim that I am a luxurious product, it is discrete and therefore, it is without fancy, it is not very loud, it is not fanciful, it is classic, it is stylish, it is understated. In the second uh, uh, facet, you will see the correspondence between relationship and culture. So, relationship is social conformity and distinction. So, those the, the relationship that the brand has with the consumer is people who stick to the rules, who go by the norms of society. So, they conform to the social norms and perhaps they do because it is in their interest, because they belong to the higher echelons of society. So, they conform to it and they also demonstrate that they have a distinction, they are different from the rest, they are above the rest. 
So, this distinction is also an element in the relationship that consumer has with the uh, consumer has with the brand Lacoste. And what is the culture that is facilitating this relationship? The culture is that of individualism, of aristocratic ideals and of classicism. So, people uh, the culture within the Lacoste brand or in, in the company is that of American individualism and aristocratic ideals. So, people who uh, use Lacoste brand they perhaps belong to that aristocratic class or they think that they belong to that aristocratic class and therefore, uh, they uh, have that distinguished position in society which they announce by using the brand Lacoste. It also has that classicism associated with that simple elegance, that understated elegance. And finally, you have the correspondence between reflection and self image. So, what does a customer think about himself when he is wearing Lacoste? And he thinks that he is a part of a club, all right, a club that is elitist, a club that is exclusive. Everybody cannot become a part of the club. So, for example, someone is wearing Lacoste, he is spending 5000 rupees to buy one t shirt and that obviously everybody cannot afford. So, that is why the person who is wearing Lacoste thinks that he is part of a club, all right. That is his self image. But when you look at the reflection, how it gets received in, in at the marketplace, uh, the, uh, the marketplace looks at such people as uh, neither feminine nor masculine or rather neither hyper feminine nor hyper masculine, which means what? People who become slightly richer uh, and they belong to a club, they, they attain manners of gentry, they start becoming very formal. Uh, not only formal, they become very mannered, many cultured. That is how they think they are. And when they get perceived by people in the marketplace, what they think is they are not boorish, they are not loud, they are not aggressive. Okay. So, they are not, though they are not hyper feminine, the men do not become like women, nor women become like men. But what happens is the extremes of the personality gets ironed out and what remains is not the hyper feminine self or not, not the hyper masculine self, but something in between which is uh, little softer, which is little understated, which is a little classic. And that is what we are seeing when we are discussing brand prism of Lacoste. So, this trans generation element also is something very important because you are you are transcending you are going be from one generation to another generation while you are holding upon that idea of classicism that idea of subtle elegance so this is what uh, the brand prism of lacoste looks like so let us uh, do a, a summary of what we have done today we have looked at the idea of brand identity and brand identity from three perspectives. The first perspective was organization's perspective, how it is the organization's responsibility to communicate that singularity, that uniqueness of brand identity. Second, we saw it from designer's perspective, where we saw that a, it is a designer's responsibility to create a visual database to create those design assets like typefaces, color, logo, tagline and how a brand manager must be aware of and understand what is, what are design assets and what is this visual database. And finally, we looked at brand prism from a marketer's perspective where we looked at brand prism or brand identity, brand identity prism created by Jean-Noël Capterer. Thank you very much.